Are you ready? Are you sitting down? The Shine On Podcast 2022. I've said before and I'll say it again. Divorce affects so many people out there. The money, the property, the assets, so many high-profile divorces. The conflict, the allegations, huge legal fee and support awards, you name it. Divorce is a true team sport. Incredible insight. Not divorce stories. Shine On Podcast. The Shine On Podcast. The Shine On Podcast 2022. episode 43 of the shine on podcast i'm evan shine and producer dave we have an absolutely incredible episode this week i'm excited i know you're excited we have a great docket and an absolutely terrific spot with our shine on podcast featured guest this week on the shine on podcast we're going to talk about emotional intelligence what is it how can you learn it and apply it and how does emotional intelligence impact each and every aspect of our daily lives our relationships, professional and personal. Is there an argument to be made that emotional intelligence sits right there at the top of what all of us are looking for today in our leaders at work and in our partners in romantic relationships? Coming up on today's episode, we get that answer and so much more as I'm joined by Dr. Robin Stern, who is the co-founder for the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. We also talk about Dr. Stern's book, The Gaslight Effect, And a new book she has coming out soon. As a psychoanalyst working with individuals, couples, and families, Dr. Stern sees firsthand how gaslighting can seriously impact a relationship and marriage and the devastating toll it can take if not spotted early on. She takes us into her own personal journey, and we talk about the signs, the signals of recognizing gaslighting behavior early in a relationship. This is an interview you don't want to miss. But producer Dave, before we get into the docket, let's talk a little baseball. Let's have fun. It's (laughs) All-Star Week. And you know what All-Star Week reminds me of? It's a great time to talk about the bet that we made on the podcast a few episodes back. And look, let's set the stage for the new listeners. My New York Yankees versus producer Dave's (laughs) Boston Red Sox. Whichever team has the better record, the other host tonight in the other city baseball game dinner and look i'm gonna put it out there this is the best yankee team in a long time and given how good this yankee team is dave i might extend it from one night i might be spending a week up in boston courtesy (laughs) of you so you better get ready uh you know i don't remember that bet do do, do you have (laughs) chapter and verse there where i can go back and listen to what i agreed to yeah it's i i was evan a, a foolish you know baseball you know, cockeyed optimist because I attended, this is what I want to talk about, just uh, reminiscing about the last time I saw the Red Sox and Yankees play in person. That was the one-game playoff last year in Fenway Park, which I really enjoyed uh, because the Red Sox won. But uh, if we need to talk about this season, yeah, um, stupid Yankees are stacked. We did catch the, the, <laughs> the, 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 the Sox did at least salvage a split in that series in Fenway Park, which was kind of a bunch of crazy games. But uh, – all right, you know, long live the rivalry. That's all I have to say. So you, you you think there's nothing stopping them? This is one of the best Yankee teams probably since late 90s, early 2000s. I mean, obviously, we'll see what happens over the rest of the season, but this is a really good Yankee team. Yeah, the lineup is disgustingly, um, you know, great from, from <laughs> top to bottom. Every time I'm waiting for some banjo hitter to get up there that we can get out, it's just another muscle bound, stupid person in pinstripes. And then you hear about Aaron Judge, and obviously the off season that's coming with is he going to break three hundred million, three hundred and fifty million? Is he going to give the Yankees a home, you know, hometown discount? Which I think the answer to that is no, given the year that he's putting up. But look, it remains to be seen. But look, whether it's New York City or Boston, anytime I get the chance to hang out with you, producer Dave, mm. it's a blast. No matter who's paying, Yankee Stadium, <laughs> Fenway Park, it's going to be a blast. All right, well. I'll have a, I'll have a portable recorder rolling so that for at least a few moments we can catch you gloating for posterity, and we'll include it on the podcast. How's that? <laughs> Sounds good to me, Dave. Let's get into the docket. All right, let's do it. And now, let's see what's on the docket. Some very interesting items on the docket today, Evan. Plucked from the news, stories that have some... Uh, connection to the world of divorce the first one comes to us from slate.com 
Item one. Headline reads, How Americans Became Convinced Divorce is Bad for Kids. And the article puts forth the proposition that I, don't, I think we would all agree to, and that's that divorce generally, historically, and conventionally considered a bad thing is very hurtful for children and, and impacting their psyche as the years go on. This article says certain research suggests that there may be more to the story. Your thoughts, Evan? Dave, there's definitely more to the story. And look, the theme of today's docket is history, right? And history often tells a story and provides context really into the evolution of laws and statutes and really cultural and societal shifts. And today we take a look at the article you mentioned from Slate by Gail Cornwall and Scott Coltrane, which really looks at and analyzes the history of divorce and specifically how Americans became convinced that divorce is bad for kids. And the article really gives a great history lesson into divorce and provides studies and statistics and great nuggets and really the shifts that have taken place over decades and decades into how we view children of divorce in terms of the short term and long term. The article provides really an evolution into how initially there was this belief that lasted a really long time that divorce was truly harmful for children. And then over time in the 80s and 90s, there started to be a shift, not a great shift, but a small shift in terms of the studies that were conducted that show that children can actually thrive when divorced parents can behave well and demonstrate a healthy co-parenting relationship. Interestingly, Dave, the article gets into movies that we've talked about before on the podcast, Kramer vs. Kramer, The War of the Roses, and the lens through which these movies portray certain characters, fathers and children, and really the push for more shared and more equal parenting time. You know, the article gets into how there was an analysis of popular press articles from 1968 to 2005, how the take on those articles was really negative in terms of divorce. And that got me thinking, what's the impact of social media now and the content that's being put out there when it comes to divorce and it comes to children? And the article also brilliantly talks about how some research suggests terms like broken home and picture books and TV shows that overrepresent nuclear families and how that contributed to the narrative that divorce is bad for kids. And Dave, this got me thinking to one of the episodes we did with Syracuse University media professor Bob Thompson, where we really looked at the impact of television and the history. And look, we've had so many great guests on the podcast, professors, psychotherapists, couples therapists, relationship experts. The list goes on and on. We talk about how children can and do thrive in the face of the parents. And this article was a history lesson and a reminder how important it is to understand the history to help us truly appreciate where we are right now. Item two comes to us from the Economic Times. Item two. According to this article, the rising stress post-pandemic and increased tension on the home front is leading to a boom in the number of divorce cases among working professionals in the country. So we've talked a lot about the dynamics of the pandemic, how it's affected divorce. This suggests post-divorce, perhaps even more of a boom. Your thoughts on this one, Evan? Dave, we stay with the history theme and we take a look at what's happening around the world when it comes to divorce. Are there trends that we're seeing across the, the world that, actually, let me back up. I we're staying with the history theme and we're taking a look at what's happening around the world when it comes to divorce. This article takes a look at what's happening in India and helps answer the question that we've talked about before on the podcast. Are divorce filings up? Rising stress levels, increased tension, uncertainty. I mean, these are just a few of the reasons the article mentions. If you're surprised, well, you really shouldn't be. But there is an eye-popping statistic in the article that puts the increase of divorces at 50 to 60 percent. And no doubt that the pandemic has changed people's perspective on life, marriage, work, relationships, and also the pursuit of happiness. But Dave, I have no doubt that the question of divorce rates, are they increasing? How much are they increasing is a question we'll be answering and tackling on the podcast and following for some time. Item three on the docket comes to us from marketwatch.com. Item three. Headline of this article reads Jimmy and Rosalind Carter on how to avoid a so-called gray divorce. The former president, Evan, is 97 years old and still with Rosalind, who's 94 years old. 
I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I forget that this couple is still alive. But God bless them. They just celebrated their 76th wedding anniversary. Not a divorce in sight for them. What do you think? And who better to give the last history lesson on the docket than the former president? And look, we've heard so much about great divorce during the pandemic. And great divorce has been on the rise. Now, check out the interview I did with Daphne DeMarnoff last summer on this topic and her thoughts on what we're seeing and why we're seeing an increase in great divorce. Two rules that the former president, Jimmy Carter, has. Number one, give your spouse some room. Number two, don't go to bed angry. I mean, I'll tell you, number one has to be pretty hard in a pandemic, given the fact that couples haven't spent this much time together since their honeymoon. And, you know, he also touches on a few keys, right? to maintaining a successful marriage. Find a supportive spouse. And his last one, marriage is work. And it's work you have to put in every single day. And look, if, if you're gonna be married for, I think you said 76 years, you know, it's, it's work in the beginning, it's work in the middle, and without a doubt, it's work at the end. We're up to the portion of the program where Evan gives thoughts on issues of the day. This week, it's the various choices of proceeding with a divorce, which avenue you should take. That's the topic of this episode's Shine on Spotlight. The Shine on Spotlight. This week, we shine a spotlight on the divorce process choices. Look, it's good to have options. And in divorce, you do have options. Litigation, mediation, collaborative law. Know your options in divorce. Know the process choices. Know what each divorce process choice looks like and the path ahead. Know the benefits of each process choice and the steps involved, the time, the cost, and really what it looks like. And the truth is there's so many myths and misconceptions out there about divorce. So educate yourself on the options and find the right path forward for you. Look, when people hear litigation, they think trial and they think trial right away. That's not the case. And when people think mediation, they may think there's no way you can mediate a high conflict divorce. Think again. When people think collaborative law, they may not know what the team concept is all about. Ask your attorney at the initial consult about these different process choices and find out which process choice may be the best option for you. Our featured guest on this week's episode of the Shine On Podcast is Dr. Robin Stern. She is the co-founder and associate director for the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence, she is a senior consultant at Yale's New Haven Hospital, where she works with doctors and nurses. She is a licensed psychoanalyst with over 30 years of experience treating individuals, couples, and family. Dr. Stern is the author of The Gaslight Effect, and she has a new book coming out, The Gaslight Recovery Guide, which we're going to talk to her about on today's episode. She's also the co-founder of OG Life Lab, and her work has been featured in major media outlets. Dr. Stern, welcome to the podcast. It's great to have you with us. Thank you so much. I'm really thrilled to be here. Thank and we're you. thrilled to have you here. And on today's episode, we're going to talk about emotional intelligence and gaslighting. And you have a tremendous book, The Gaslight Effect. You have a new book, as I mentioned, coming out. But first, let's talk emotional intelligence. And there's absolutely no one better to have on to discuss this topic. You study it, you research it, and you teach it. So to start, what is emotional intelligence? Very simply, emotional intelligence is being smart about your feelings. Using your emotions to guide your thinking, using your thinking to guide your emotions. I feel like we hear people say, you know what? That person has a high EQ. That person gets it. When someone hears those words, what does that mean? I'm really glad you asked that question because very often when people say that, they're talking about somebody's personality. Somebody can be very charming or make you feel, somebody can be a very good intimacy builder and ask you a lot of questions to bring you close or to get to know you very quickly and yet not be very skillful in, for example, when they feel triggered, when they feel dysregulated, not be very skillful in understanding the impact they're having on you during the conversation. So it's important not to confuse emotional intelligence with somebody's nice personality, just as it's important not to confuse somebody's nice personality with a good character. So emotional intelligence is about being smart about your emotions. It's also about having a mindset that 
allows you to give yourself the permission or encourages you to give yourself the permission to feel. That's the place to start. And my colleague, Mark Brackett, wrote a great book called Permission to Feel. Permission to Feel, allowing yourself to have all emotions. There are no good or bad emotions. They all give you data and information. And then beyond that, what's your mindset about emotions? Is are emotions meaningful to you? Do they are they helpful, or are they, as they used to be thought, a distraction? Do they get in your way? Is that your mindset? So we we encourage people to have the mindset of an emotion scientist, to be curious, to be open, to not judge your own emotions or those of other people, to be the learner, not the knower. You mentioned emotions and it being something that perhaps we used to think about as a distraction. And has that now changed into now taking those emotions and thinking about it differently in today's world? And how did that shift happen? So very much so. It, It is very different. And I would say that it was different before the pandemic. People through science, through data, through many, many decades of research, including research at our own center, we, we discovered and or let the world know that emotions matter for five important reasons, really for all of life. The emotions matter for our ability to focus and pay attention. Imagine if you are really upset because, for example, you're a kid on a school bus, somebody just bullied you and you go, have to go into school and take a test. Can you really concentrate? Of course not. Emotions matter, number two, for decision-making. So think about it. Have you ever made a bad decision, Evan? (laughs) I've made a handful of bad decisions. Maybe a few dozen, right? (laughs) That's right. right. So we know that our emotions are at play when we're making decisions and when we're using judgment. Is it good judgment? Not so good judgment. For example, we had a study where we took a large group of educators, split them in two, and then we gave one group a positive prompt to write about. Tell us about a good day you had. And the other group, not so positive prompt. Tell us about a not so good day. In fact, an unpleasant day. And then we gave them student work to grade. The people, the educators who had the positive prompt graded the student work one to two grade points higher. And what was even more interesting is that we asked people, the educators, do you think your emotions impacted your ability to give a fair grade? What did they say? Of course, they said no. Ninety Over 90% of them said no. Our emotions had nothing to do with it, right? And then even more interesting, when we gave the educators in the two groups, we ran the study again, and we gave them the opportunity to just write about the way they were feeling after they wrote about the good day and the bad day, then the effect was gone. So we know that, I mean, this is why being skillful is important, right? So we know that if you're aware of what you're feeling, then your feelings are not in control of you. It's when you're not aware of what you're feeling, or you don't call it to mind, that your emotions are in control of you and you're not in control of them. Emotional intelligence. Is it something that for some people, it just comes very natural? And for those where it doesn't, how does someone learn it over time and develop that skill to apply in all different life situations? Great question. So your question allows me to finish the answer that I was giving you before. So we have, we start with permission to feel, and then we have an emotions mindset that emotions matter. And in fact, they matter for the reasons that I just started to explain. And then we talk about being an emotion scientist rather than an emotion judge, where you're curious and open and non-judgmental and, and do have a growth mindset. And then we have skills. So the skills of emotional intelligence in our center are the acronym RULER. First, three letters, R-U-L, are the experiencing part of emotional intelligence. So recognizing, understanding, labeling, knowing that you're having a feeling, understanding what caused that feeling and labeling it accurately. So for example, there's a big difference in my communication to you. If I tell you, you know what? I'm really frustrated with you, Evan. 
or I'm really angry with you. And if I'm going to communicate accurately and you're going to hear me and meet me where I am, you need to know what specifically, what, what emotions specifically I'm feeling and what, and how you're going to respond to me is dependent on what you think I'm feeling. One of the mistakes that I think is really significant that people make, that couples make and friends make and parents and children make is assuming what someone else is feeling. Either because you might feel that way in a particular situation or because you might be behaving in a way that I behave, for example, when I'm frustrated, maybe I slam the door. And so you slam the door, I assume you're frustrated and I never ask you, right? And if I never ask you, what are you feeling? Are you frustrated? Like, that's what I do when I'm frustrated. Then I never give you the chance to say, yes, actually I am. Or no, I feel really sad right now. Or I feel really embarrassed right now. You mentioned couples. So looking at it from the couples dynamic, a marital situation, examples that you just provided, the slamming of the door or saying that you're frustrated or, or angry, if those emotions and conversations don't get explored and, and the conversations don't take place. What happens over over time to couples, dynamic, or relationship if there's just a total lack of communication and discussion as to how someone's really feeling and without any specificity? It's not a good for it's not a good predictor of success. I mean let me just say that differently. It's not, it's not great. Just simply, it's not great. I, it's a basic human need to feel seen and understood. And if the person you love and are married to or is planning to spend your life with doesn't see you and understand you, doesn't hear you and meet you where you are, after a while, when that happens over and over again, often you just give up. That's what I see in my practice. I've been treating couples for over 30 years. Sometimes people give up. And even if they stay in the marriage, it's not a fulfilling, satisfying, whole relationship. And sometimes they don't stay in the marriage. Sometimes that's known and sometimes that's not known. But what I have, I, I'll, I'll say more about that because I think it's really important to, for your listeners and people you work with that it, it's really important to be insightful about, gee, you remind me of my brother, you know, and when you do that thing, it drives me crazy. But if I don't have the skills to do something about my own feelings in those moments, or I don't have the, the confidence that I haven't given myself permission to feel, to express that feeling, even if you remind me of my brother and I have that insight, it doesn't, it's, there's nothing that I can do in the relationship without taking that risk, without being the first person to connect around an issue that might be tough or to repair an argument that we just have. And so I, I just, I noticed that through the years, it's that insight is simply not enough. When we think of emotional intelligence, and you mentioned the pandemic, the times that we're living in, we hear so much about pivoting, adapting these challenging, you know, times that all of us are living in personally, yeah. professionally. When we think of emotional intelligence, who are people that come to mind for you as having tremendously high IQ, whether it's in leadership, companies, organizations, politics, you tell us who are the people that have, have it? Well, it's interesting. So first of all, it occurred to me that I only shared with you R-U-L, which is the experiencing part of emotions and emotional intelligence. Sorry. There's an E and an R, which is expressing and regulating emotions. So I'm going to pivot from your question and come back to it. Sure. So expressing emotions at the right time, to the right degree, to the right person in the right way, very skillful, right? If you If you can do that, you're very skillful. And most people have a lot of constraints on that skill, right? Their own, or a lot of influences, the way they were brought up, their own comfort level with emotions. So for example, think about your own childhood and where you grew up. Were you encouraged to express pleasant and unpleasant feelings? Did the adults around you express 
pleasant and unpleasant feelings. I know, for example, in my home, it, people expressed a lot more unpleasant feelings, critical feelings. Even, I mean, my parents were very loving, but they weren't necessarily skillful in emotional intelligence. They did express their frustration or, or something they were critical of or their anger. So that's expressing. And then there's another thing that, that's really important about expressing that happens every single day at work, probably in your line of work, maybe even right now or in other times in a podcast, where what you're experiencing is different than what you are displaying. So we have display rules. We have them at work. We have them at home. I have them at Yale. I have them... Sure wherever I, whatever context I'm in, right? And we are not always free to or choose to express what we're really feeling because the display rules demand that we be happy or that we be cheery or that we be positive. During the last couple of years, so th this discrepancy but what, between what you feel and what you show is called emotion labor. And that emotion labor that emotion labor or emotional labor, whichever you want to say, comes at a great cost to us because it's, it's depleting and exhausting. It can cause you to be numb after a while when you're constantly at a distance. During the pandemic, we saw so much of that for our do doctors and nurses and educators and therapists and, and anyone in a service industry and anyone, even our, excuse me, even in our our school administrators who were leading teams of people who were looking to them to say, is everything going to be okay? Like, are we going to make it through? What's going to happen? And I heard from leader after leader, not only in education, but in business, that it was very lonely for them, very isolating because they had a lot of anxiety. Sometimes they would allow themselves to be vulnerable and say, I'm worried too. And I'm going to do my best to take care of everyone here. Sometimes they didn't even feel that freedom to say, I'm worried too. And a lot of the burnout and, and people talking about their souls hurting at the end of the pandemic, which by the way, is not even the end sure. of the pandemic, but people are beyond, beyond burned out, right? Because of what they saw, this constant stress caused by the unpredictability and out of control nature and, and the feeling that it will never end. And then not to mention the warring politicians and the, the different news about the masking, not masking. So it, it all was exhausting from the environment and the stress was, was quite heavy, but also the emotion labor when they had to go in and put on a happy face, or at least put on a, I'm in control face, but maybe they didn't feel that way. Has that changed in terms of when we look at our leaders and again, whether it's in education, in politics, companies, has that changed to now we want and expect our leaders, our managers, people who make decisions for companies to be more vulnerable, to, to, to be more open with their emotions? Has the pandemic been the foundational piece for that? change we we you know we, in, in terms of what we expected or how we thought of our leaders before and you mentioned people not being able to be vulnerable is that now or our best leaders ones who can display vulnerability i think it's a strength to display vulnerability and not only that it's a wonderful role model for example my colleague mark Brackett and i at the center work with dr roy herbst at Yale New Haven Hospital. And Dr. Herbst is the head of medical oncology. He leads many physicians who have their own teams in oncology. Way before the pandemic, Dr. Herbst felt that all of his leaders could benefit from developing their own skills. Because of, as a physician, your training is about your patient. Focus on the patient. Your, your feelings, the traditional training is your feelings may get in the way. But Dr. Herbst had a different attitude. He really was a visionary. And he said, no, let my team is going to work with their emotions because we know that once 
you are skillful in your emotional in, 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 in emotional intelligence. You're more aware of the impact you're having on other people. You're more aware of the things that are that are difficult for you. You can reach out. You can ask for help. When you're emotionally intelligent, you can manage those difficult emotions and, and not let them spill over, just as an example. So what he did was to give uh, with us, he gave all of his team an assessment in emotional intelligence. And then when he unpacked the assessment with his team for each of them, he also did it for himself. And I remember a, a meeting, a staff meeting or a leadership meeting where Dr. Herbst took the risk of sharing his own scores and how he was going to change it was an incredible moment of modeling and bravery in, in the hospital. We need more leaders like that. Absolutely. 100% agree. When we look at children and situations that children find themselves in at a very young age, and you mentioned your own personal experiences in terms of what was expressed, what was discussed, mm -hmm. how did those experiences from early on in life and different things that people experience early on in childhood affect things later on in life in terms of emotional intelligence and how we experience different situations and how we respond to certain life interactions going forward. That in and of itself could be an entire podcast um, that <laughs> question. But so, so let me, let me start somewhere. Sure. One of the things that we talk a lot about at our, at the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence is the power of self-talk, particularly the destructive power of negative self-talk. So on a given day, how many times do you say, I'm terrific. I, I just, I know this podcast is going to, it's just going to be great <laughs> because I'm, I'm really a great interviewer, terrific with my questions. Or are you more likely to say, I don't know about this. I don't know, you know, what if the vibe isn't right? What if I can't come up with questions? I'm not really that familiar with this particular topic. I'm not talking just about us. I'm talking about just in general, you know, how many people get up and, and say to themselves, I'm great. Not many. You know, most people are, I can't believe what I look like this morning, my hair, my, you know, I'm, I'm too thin, I'm too fat, I'm too short, I'm too tall. And even on the Yale campus where kids were, had, were in the place of their dreams, right? We, we worked with many freshmen, for example, who, when we asked them about their self-talk, said it was almost all negative. I'm not going to make it. I'm not going to get the grades. I'm never going to have a boyfriend. I'm never going to have a girlfriend. I'm not going to get the internship. I can't believe. And where do you get your self-talk? To your point, right? The way your parents and the adults around you talk to you about you is the way you're going to talk to yourself later in life. And so those early messages are incredibly important. And I, I could imagine every parent listening is going to say, oh, my God, right? It's not that one moment that you were hard on your kid that they are going to remember for the rest of their lives and that's going to shape them. But the consistency over time of either positive messaging helps to shape that kind of positive self-talk or not, right? Of course, there are other influences on you, your peers, especially at certain ages as you're growing up. But that's one example. The other example is what do you see in your house? So if you could roll back the movie of your life and take a look at people's ability to express and regulate their emotions effectively in a really helpful way, like what would that movie be called? Now you have me thinking. <laughs> <laughs> So when I ask that question of audiences, or we ask that question of audiences, most of the time people say a dysfunctional day, like chaos, because our parents certainly didn't have the ability to be trained in emotional intelligence. So most of us didn't have those great role models. Most of us didn't get up in the morning and come down to breakfast and have parents say to us, gee, honey look a little sad. Let me give you an emotionally intelligent strategy to help you. with. So those messages that, that your children are watching you, you know, that's a big message to parents. 
So when you see, when you're growing up and you're watching your parents, you're learning from their behavior. You're listening to what they have to say. And you just, you download it for free. And that's just tremendous insight and advice on all fronts, the, the parent perspective. And let's stay in the family context and talk relationships and segue to your book. First, divorce and emotional intelligence. Divorce is highly emotional. How can having a high IQ and even thinking about you know, ruler and, and, and the skills that we yeah. talked about help people navigate the very difficult path of divorce? I would say step by step and with patience and compassion for yourself and your spouse. So if you are committed to moving through even a difficult divorce, it's important in every conversation and in between the conversations, in your talk with your friends or your kids, particularly if there are kids involved, they're always the victims, right? Or I shouldn't say always. They're often the victims of, of the trash talk between parents who are splitting up. Being aware of what you feel, understanding what you do when you feel a certain way. You know, well, what do I typically do when I'm angry or I'm resentful or I feel embarrassed or humiliated? Do I blame? Do I vent? Do I gossip? And checking in with yourself. Is that really what you want to be doing? We have a concept, even before I continue with the step-by-step -step piece, we have a concept in, in our work called the be, being your best self. And being your best self means the you you aspire to be at any moment in the role you're in. So my best self is a mom or I met my best self as a partner. My best self is a human being, right? And it may be really hard to, to gather that energy to be your best self in a situation where you feel either you didn't want the divorce or you wanted the divorce because you're furious and you were betrayed or you can't anymore or you were gaslighted for years or it just isn't working anymore and you just can't wait to get out. There are lots of reasons why, why someone would not want to be their best selves, like lots of barriers. and. Um, not insignificantly is the barrier of being depleted and exhausted. So for example, over the pandemic or at other times where people are just like, they are strung out, they are stressed out, they, they just have to get out. It's really hard to marshal that, that energy and to, to be your best self. So, but back to the skills of emotional intelligence and how they impact. So recognizing and understanding and then being able to, as I said earlier, label what you're feeling so that not just for your spouse or your soon-to-be ex-spouse, but for yourself. So, and then expressing and regulating in the right way at the right time and regulating your own emotions. You don't have to. Regulating emotions is important for you to use helpful strategies so that you're not stressed out of your mind right. all the time. <laughs> you mentioned, and I love that, that, that slogan, be your best self. And you mentioned gaslighting. So let's segue into your book, The Gaslight Effect. And I understand you have a new book coming out. Yeah. Starting with your new book and Guy, tell us about the inspiration behind that. So I wrote my first book in 2007, The Gaslight Effect. And I wrote the book because... I was seeing among my friends, experienced myself, and in my practice, many people, particularly women, because that's the coupling I saw most often in my private practice, who were otherwise successful and confident, second-guessing themselves because somebody, their partner, who they were intimate with, who they had given some power to, was telling them something that was completely not true. And yet causing them to second guess their own thinking. I'll use myself as an example. So I was married to a guy who had a great personality, lovely, charming. And so he wasn't an intimidator. In my book, I talk about three types of gaslighter. He was a good guy gaslighter, that's what I would say. And he was perennially late. He was always late, 10 minutes, a half hour, 35 minutes. And when I would say to him, you know, 
I feel really disrespected when you're late. He would say to me, that's your problem because you have a problem with time. Your parents told you that people need to be on time. What's the big deal? And first I thought, oh, wait. no, I don't have a problem with time. I'm respectful and I live in this world and people make plans and they come on time and you just don't want to deal with being disrespectful to me. You don't want to apologize. Just say, I'm sorry. I don't have anything to be, I'm sorry with. This is your parents teaching you and there's something really wrong with you. Over time, over the years, the early years that we were together for a long time, I just absolutely knew that he was wrong. And then I began to think because he was insisting over and over again that it was my problem. I began to think, gee, I wonder if another woman would see it differently. I wonder if I am a little uptight about time. And what was crazy was that I was actually writing about gaslighting. I knew what was happening, but I still <laughs> was feeling this way, right? So that was in 2007, I wrote this book about relationships and people wrote back to me and said, oh my God, have you been standing in my living room? Like, have you been overhearing my conversations? So I knew that I identified something that people had been experiencing and yet couldn't name. Because when you think about it, like if someone comes into your office or, or goes to a friend and that person has black and blue marks, they can look at the person, the perpetrator, and say, he did it to me. But when you come in with this kind of feeling of I, something's wrong and I, I just don't know, I don't feel confident anymore. I don't know if I'm thinking straight. Women especially have the tendency to turn their finger to themselves and say, there's something wrong with me. Oh, and I see that in my practice, whether it's, you know, gaslighting or, you know, other non-physical forms of domestic violence, course, control and psychological manipulation. Yeah. And Dr. certain in that moment for you that you described about the good guy gaslighter, is that the hardest type of personality or gaslighting behavior to spot? They're all hard. It's hard because... When you're with, for example, the guy who I called the glamour gaslighter, who brings you flowers and showers you with love, you're, you're in this fantasy and you can't imagine anything better. So when you're confronted with the gaslighting behavior or with this feeling of, I, like, I don't know. I mean, he's just so amazing. Why do I feel like such crap all the time? Right? It's, you're looking at the, there's a tendency to look at the other part of the picture and not that moment because that moment's over. He gaslighted you, you feel like crap, but then it's the next day and he bought you a present or he bought you roses and, and it's easy. It's really easy because you want the relationship or because, I mean, I talk in my book about like, why, why is it so hard to admit that there's, it's hard to give up the fantasy. Sometimes when you let go of your gaslighter or your husband or your wife, you're letting go of a lot. And you have to be willing to make that sacrifice to have your integrity. Do I think it's worth it? Absolutely. That's why I wrote the book, to help people get out. And that is why I wrote The Recovery Guide as well. Because after all these years and with the popularity of the concept of gaslighting that happened in the run-up to the election in 2016, people were saying, I, I want to go deeper. I want to understand a little bit more about like why I'm doing this and what were the early influences on my life. And so I wrote this book to one, take it deeper and to offer some of the psychoanalytic or psychological influences that I didn't really get into in my first book, but also as a, as a way that people can take themselves on a personal journey through exploring their relationship and make a decision. Do they want to get out? Do they want to limit it? And how can they do it? And there's nothing like walking through that journey slowly and at your own pace. Tell us, so, about, yeah. Yeah. No. T tell us about that journey that, that you uh, described where people are making that decision. Should they stay in the relationship, stay in the marriage? Should they go to couples therapy and, and try to work on things with someone who is a gaslighter? Walk us through what that's like how challenging, how difficult it can be when you're dealing with someone 
who has that personality? Yeah, there are so many places to start to answer that question. I would say that, first of all, it is not easy because there are reasons that people stay in these relationships, like in in all marriages, even if it's not gaslighting and other difficult marriages, people don't, people are not um, out to hurt themselves. They're there because they're getting something whether it's that fantasy or economic security or the feeling that they, they, they belong to someone else, very powerful, or they're not having to experience the shame of, oh my God, I violated my own integrity. Or like, I just lost my life for, for five years. Like I gave up on my own schooling or I, I left a job because I was coming home too late for my gas lighter and he didn't like it. You know, and people really suffer with that. And so often it's easier, Evan, to stay in the relationship than to face those things and get out. And often also one, it's often a third person who will say to the gaslightee, what are you doing? You know that there's nothing wrong with you. You know, you've always known that it's this guy is trying to drive you crazy. I mean, I, I, I've worked with couples where the stories were so seemingly nuts that my publisher didn't even want me to tell them in the first book. And nobody would believe you. One of the people I worked with through the years came to me because she, she had moved out of town with her boyfriend because he was attending law school. I'm sure that not all lawyers are gaslighters. In fact, my brother is one. I know he's not. So I didn't mean it. Any, any <laughs> don't take offense. Yeah. But he was attending law school out of town and she really didn't want to move. And she did though. And they got married and they were relocated somewhere else. And he took her out to dinner as a celebration for one of her birthdays to her favorite place. And they sat down to dinner. And when the cake came, she started to tear up and he said to her, oh, you know, I know this is like a really special night and, and I'm so, I feel so good that, that I was able to move you like this or something like that. I don't remember exactly the words, but she said to him, I'm not crying because of that. I'm crying because I, I do love you, but I miss my family. And he flipped out. And so he then really made a scene at the restaurant, threw the the tableware on the floor, started yelling at her, I can't believe you're such an ungrateful bitch. I can't believe it. I, I really went out of my way to buy you a gift, take you to the special place. By the end of the dinner, she was on her knees and begging him to forgive her for ruining dinner. Wow. And she said to me, but I actually did. I did ruin the dinner. Because if I hadn't said anything, he wouldn't have yelled at me. And then she would look at me and say, isn't that true? Isn't that true that if I hadn't have done that? So it's all my fault. Another case similarly to that, or another case similar, boyfriend, girlfriend, walking down the street in their neighborhood, he didn't like it when she would say hello to other people on the street. And she said, this is who I am. It's my personality. I said, well... I don't like it. It's disrespectful. And first she thought, that's crazy. It's not disrespectful. I'm just being who I am. Do you love me? Do you like me? You don't, we don't have to be together. But she liked him. He liked her. They continued on. To over time, she came into therapy at the point where she said to me, do you think, Dr. Stern, that it would be wrong if I walked down the street only looking at the pavement so I wouldn't have to be tempted? to say hello to people, because after all, I think my boyfriend's right. You know, if I'm walking with him, why am I saying hello to someone else? And so what do you think about that? What do you think about when we sit in a restaurant that I always face the wall so that I don't have to look at other people? And that question to me was an indication of where she was in her gaslighting tango with her boyfriend. And those are two incredible and powerful stories. So in both those examples, and you can pick one from the therapist perspective, how difficult is it to change the mindset and to really, to work with someone, to help them realize that 
no, it's not your fault that this is what's happening in the relationship, in the dynamic, in the marriage, but it's not your fault. And is there a domino effect where when someone questions themselves in relationships, in a marriage, it carries over to other parts of their life, whether it's at work or with, let's say, friends? So I'll ask, answer the domino effect question first. So, so over, so of course, yes, over time. So if you are constantly questioning yourself and you feel like you are, there's something wrong with you and you, you can't think straight and, and you're and ultimately, you know, if I really loved him, I would do exactly what he says. So that will carry over in the sense that you begin to lose the ability to make decisions. You stop talking to your friends because your friends are saying things to you like, are you nuts? You know, like, get rid of this guy. He's an asshole. Yep. And you're like, yes, but he's, I know that doesn't seem right, but it, after all, it is my fault. Because if you put, if you write down a timeline, of, like a sequence of, I walked out of my house, I, we were having a great time. We were holding hands. He was kissing me. I looked at a, a guy said hello to me on the street and I smiled back and everything fell apart. Whose fault is that? You know, so to see, to help a, a gaslightee delineate between something that she may have done and then the the reaction of the gaslighter, which he has to own and isn't owning, is a very difficult process. So very long process sometimes, sometimes years, sometimes years. Oh. Oh. And um, sometimes shorter than that, depending on when, the person comes into treatment and the resources they have on the outside, meaning do they have some, a good friend? Like I, I call them flight attendants in my book. You know, do you have a good friend who knows you for many years and can say to you, this is not like you. This is not good. You haven't called me in six months. I'm your best friend, or we haven't spent time together in six months. Interesting. And Dr. Sharon, what are things that someone can do to avoid if possible, this type of relationship altogether or to spot and see the red flags very early into the relationship? I would say number one is self-awareness. If you think there's something wrong, but you just don't know what it is, there's something wrong. <laughs> and it may not be gaslighting. It may be something else. Maybe you just don't like the person. Maybe you have different styles. But if you don't like the way somebody's treating you, then there is no such thing as that's wrong, right? If you are somebody who knows what your opinion is, then when somebody's challenging it, bringing it back to yourself, but wait a minute, if I were alone on an island, what would I think? And so sometimes you need to put yourself alone on an island, take a break, opt out of the conversation. Don't stay in a conversation that is a power struggle. If you find yourself defending yourself, just move away from the conversation, even if it's for a few minutes. Take it up another time. Agree to disagree. Opt out and say, I can't have this conversation when I feel so heated. Remember that no is a whole sentence. Remember that it's much less important in a back and forth who's right and who's wrong than how you feel. You can come to decide who's right or wrong. But if you are being attacked, and feeling like somebody's calling you crazy in whatever way, that's not okay. Writing things down is super helpful. Because if I say to you, hey, Evan, you know, I'm, I don't really get it. We, we had an appointment. This is the third time I've been standing on a line and waiting for you. And I don't really get it. And you say to me, what are you talking about? Like, we didn't have that agreement. Did you have it or not? You know you had it. So how come all of a sudden he's telling you you didn't have it and you're wondering, did I have it? Interesting. So if you write that down in that interaction that I was just describing, like you never said, hey, I'm sorry. I don't remember it that way. Or I won't do it again. Or you're right. I have done this. It was all about me. Like I was saying something about the way I feel. I'm really, you know, I didn't like it. And you just made it about me. When you have that pivot in the conversation, watch out for gaslighting. Dr. Stern, between book one, The Gaslight Effect, and the new book that you have coming out, did any research, any story, 
Did anything surprise you when you were working on the, the second book? I would say that between the first and the second book, the pandemic happened and people who were unable to manage their own stress before were even less good at it. During that time, more people were finding out things about their spouses that they didn't know and maybe confronting them. And people were saying like, that's ridiculous, you know, or you just, you're too anal about that, or you're too uptight, or you're too sensitive. Or I remember a couple telling me that she overheard her boyfriend on a phone call during the pandemic when they were in lockdown, <laughs> that he probably before the pandemic took elsewhere. Sure. And she confronted him on it. And he said to her, do you have a problem? Like, how paranoid are you? Come on, how paranoid are you? And first she said, no, I'm not paranoid. But over time, because probably he started to hide the phone calls away from her, she would consistently say, I, I think he might be having an affair. But every time she confronted him, he said she was paranoid. So she began to think she was, he was paranoid. Guess what? She wasn't so paranoid. Or no. she was paranoid, but didn't mean that somebody wasn't following her. Right? When I think about it in my practice, the stigma that w was around prenuptial agreements 30, 40 years ago and, and how it's much more accepted. A divorce was taboo and now it's much more accepted. The feeling of admitting that you're in this type of relationship, the gaslighting relationship, is it different now in terms of being open, not being afraid or concerned about speaking and discussing this type of relationship? Well, I would say it a little bit differently. I think gaslighting is much more popular now. It's much more part of the discourse. So people come to, will admit it more freely, or at least they have a name for what they're going through. Mm -hmm. But prenuptial agreements are like a hotbed for gaslighting to happen. So, you know, you say to me, I'm going to give you a million dollars in my estate if we ever get divorced. And, and on my death, you can have my entire estate. And I say, you know, it's really wonderful, but we have three children and they're all in private school and, and, or we're going to have children. Sorry, it's a prenup. We're going to have children. And I, you know, you're telling them you're not going to give me alimony. You're not going to give me child support. You're just going to give me a million dollars. And that sounds like a lot of money right now, but, but I don't know. And you look at me and you say, how greedy can you be? I didn't even think of you as a golden. How greedy can you be? And so it is, I've seen a lot of people go through prenups with that kind of accusation where each one of them ends up feeling not very good about themselves because they're asking for something that the other person doesn't want to give them. I 100% I agree. And I see that in my practice all the time, much more so in recent years. And when I talk to people about the prenuptial agreement and the process, it, it, it ends up being so much about the communication. How do you, what's the first conversation like? What's the dialogue? How do you have that conversation? I think it's incredibly important for people to work with, whether it's a couples therapist or someone to facilitate that conversation because it is a very, very difficult conversation to have if there's a disparity between the income that and the wealth, and it's not an easy conversation. And if that conversation isn't handled the right way, then in terms of looking ahead and, and, and future conversations, whether it's about having children, about money, about where you're going to live, whatever jobs, careers, whatever it may be, it doesn't really set the right message to have those conversations if the prenups will agreement conversation is not handled the right way. I completely agree with you. And one of the reasons that that I was motivated um, to develop the concept with my colleague of the best self was there are no do-overs. So once you say to someone, you're a gold digger, maybe you take it back, maybe you apologize, but it's out, uh -huh. you know, and that person likely doesn't forget it. And I've seen the, the ripple effects or the shadow prenups haunt couples for years and they move on. But the sting of that accusation is with them. And sometimes it's really hard to get over. So that's also where there's an intersection between gaslighting and emotional intelligence. As with many other kinds of relational abuse and emotional intelligence, you have to be skillful, right? In negotiating your own emotions, no matter what's coming at you. 
And if you're not skillful, then you get into a very, very difficult dynamic. This has been really fun, Evan, and really great. And I hope important. Dr. Stern, this was fantastic. Really incredible. And thank you so much for coming on the podcast, your book, The Gaslight Effect. And you have a new book coming out. Congratulations on that. Tell thank everyone you. where they can find the books and learn about all the wonderful things that you're doing. So you can find the book, hopefully, um, in the not too distant future, because the publication date is February of 2023. It'll be out uh, a little bit before that and pre-orders on Amazon and all of the other places that you can buy books. And it's called The Gaslight Effect Recovery Guide. And, and I wish you all very good luck on your personal journeys and may your lives be gaslight free and emotionally intelligent. You can also find out about my work and the work of the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. Thank you so much for elevating emotional intelligence and gaslighting. Really appreciate it. Thank you for coming on. It was a pleasure. Episode 43. That's a wrap. What a show. Dr. Robin Stern. She was brilliant. Great spot with her. And I can't wait to read her new book. And the guy who makes it all happen, producer Dave of the Boston Podcast Network. What a show. What a docket. What an interview with Dr. Stern. Dave, what are your thoughts? My thoughts are I'm still disgusted that my Red Sox are tragically in second place. But otherwise, <laughs> thrilled, thrilled at the quality and entertainment value of this episode. Well done, Evan, once again. Thank you to you, Dave, and thank you to all the listeners. You can listen to podcasts on all major podcast platforms, YouTube and Pond 617. Follow the podcast. Send in your comments and questions. Devin at ShineOnDivorce.com. Follow me on social media for the latest content. I'm Evan Shine, and I'll talk to you again real soon.